the philosophy of science looks at the domain of the measurable and repeatable, or we can say the domain of measurable, repeatable specifically, which is always going to be third person. And so there are some philosophical assumptions about what third person means, what first person means, and what the relationship between first and third person are, or reifying what we mean by subjective, what we mean by objective, and what the relationship between subjective and objective are. That um, Forrest's work starts at that level, and the reification gives the basis to then be able to uh, ground the philosophy of science in something deeper than it. Like, obviously, if we're looking at the domain of measurable and repeatable, we, we have to start with measurable. And a measurement always involves a measurer measuring some measured. There's a triplicate relationship between the observed, the process of observation, and the observer. And yet, then what we try to do is take, for the most part, the measurement process and especially the measurer for granted and create an ontology of measureds, even though the fundamental basis of the concept of measurement itself isn't even semantically frameable in a logical way without those three concepts being bound. So it's very interesting. If you look at kind of Vedantic idealism or Buddhist idealism or solipsism in general on one side, and you look at physicalism on the other side, I would say that they make the exact same reductive mistake. So Physicalism says that objective or physical is fundamentally real and subjective is either not real, like it's just an illusion, a la, you know, uh, radical eliminativism, or it's an epiphenomena. It's, uh, you know, secondary. And they have a very compelling argument for that, right? The compelling argument is it requires assuming a bunch of things as more epistemically grounded than I think they are. But so big bang, just a bunch of plasma and then particles and whatever. It doesn't seem like there's anything we can call consciousness in there. Eventually planets at a certain point, hy hydrological, biological process, proto cells, whatever. It's very hard to think about consciousness before that. So it seems like there was physical stuff before there was consciousness stuff. So then consciousness must have emerged out of there. And if people can describe their subjective experience while well hooked up to an EEG or an fMRI, and we can look at their brain and we can see some type of statistical correlation between patterns of brain and their subjective experience, then we can say there's a correlation between subjective and objective. But we think that the objective is controlled by the objective, i.e. that physics is causally closed. Therefore, your brain state this moment is the result of your brain state a moment ago. And the particle physics that governs, you know, ion differentials of what's going to actually happen in the brain in relationship with the body and the environment. So if there is a one for one correlation between described subjective states and observed objective states and the objective states are the result of scientific causation and there's closure over that, then subjectivity must be a, a causal epiphenomena, right? Like there's various versions of that argument. And as you can see, you know, argument between Sam Harris and Dan, Dan Dennett, who both would typically think of themselves as being mostly informed by the philosophy of science come to you know, Dan Dennett says that consciousness is not real, but free will is. And Sam says free will is not real, but consciousness is. And um, at the end of their argument, Sam said something like, it appears we have fundamentally different intuitions on this, which was actually very important, which meant that the symbol grounding was actually the, the key thing. And this is where you get Tarski's theorem, you know, coming out of Gödel's theorem, which is that any formal logical system involves ideas that cannot be reified in that system. And that means that there is no logical system that is consistent that's also complete. And I now this comes back to why I said there is no perfect social system. And it comes back to why the first thing Lao Tzu said when he wrote his book is that the Tao that is nameable is not the eternal Tao. Is the formal system that is complete is is doesn't exist, right? Okay, so we can see how basically philosophy of science is an Obviously, I'm radically oversimplifying to go quickly, and we can do the nuance thing at some point. So the question, what is real? Philosophy of science says, well, the stuff that is measurable and repeatable seems to be pretty clearly real because we might think that 
sound is faster than light, but we can all measure that it's not, and it's the same every time. And so the the congruency of objectivity and the repeatability of it and its independence to our beliefs about it seems like a good basis for real. And then the fact that we can make predictions with it and make shit out of it that works and whatever. And so then, of course, you have an epistemology, which is measuring and repeating and then testing and, you know, like that, which is you have an epistemology of third person that is the epistemology that makes sense, starting with the ontologic assumption that what is real is the stuff that you can assess via that epistemology. And so then you do a bunch of third person assessment and all you find is causation and third person. And so, of course, you end up then coming to what is real is third person stuff because your whole process has been measurements on third person stuff. So there's an ontological assumption that creates an, an appropriate epistemology that then proves the ontological assumption. So then Vedanta or Buddhism did the exact same thing on the opposite side. They say that subjectivity is fundamental and objectivity is either an illusion or Maya, you know, et cetera, or an epiphenomena, the structures arising within consciousness. And they argue it in a very similar kind of way on the opposite. They say, well, I don't really, I can't prove that I'm not dreaming or in a hallucination or anything else. So my measurements might all be part of a dream and you and the repeatability of it is all part of my dream. So I have less epistemic ground on the objective stuff out here than I have on the basis that there is an experience arising, that I'm actually experiencing something. Descartes said something obviously very similar to this. And so what I have the most epistemic grounding on is that experience is occurring. But my perception of myself as experiencer might be an illusion. There is a self here, but it might be different than I think it is. And there's a world, but it might be different than I think it is. So there is some self experiencing a world experience or experiencing an experience, but they, the experienced and the experiencer might have delusion, but the experience is prima facie occurring. So what I can, what is real is that which can be experienced as opposed to measured and repeated. Therefore I have an epistemology of inquiry and noticing the nature of experience and running experiments in there of moving attention in certain ways and seeing what happens with experience. And so I get a phenomenological epistemology. And then that ends up confirming, see, everything that I notice is experience and everything that is objective is a right. I can only say even exists because I'm experiencing it. If I couldn't actually experience the measurement, the measurement wouldn't have occurred. This is the, if the tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, right? So I would say that they both basically made an ontologic assumption that then created an epistemology that then confirmed the ontologic assumption and East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. And then, of course, in Silicon Valley and whatever, we do this very funny thing, like take principles of Buddhism to do a mindfulness practice to crush the competition more effectively, <laughs> which is a very funny, strange hybrid of um kind of the, the game theoretic versions of both, but underneath the experience. So, okay. The Vedantist will walk you through a process and say, notice the tree. Now notice that you aren't the tree. You're the one noticing the tree. Okay. So notice some other objects. Notice that you aren't those objects. You're the one noticing the objects. Now notice your thoughts. Those thoughts are objects, objects of attention. So notice that you, you can hold an image of the tree in your mind. So you aren't the thoughts. You are the witness of the thoughts and you aren't the emotions, the sensations, because you're witnessing them on and on. And so all of those are not ultimately what you are. They're changing. What is unchanging in all of them is the witness. Therefore, you know, the Upanishads say again and again, only the self is real. Only the witness is real. Right. But they started with an observer observing and observed. Right. I had to start with the tree. I had to start with a bunch of objects to even point at the subject because the subject is not even definable outside of its relationship with an object, whether the object is a perception or the perceived, right? And so I took for granted that I was only able to even notice subjectivity or consciousness or reference it by starting with subjective, objective, and the relationship between them, which is the same thing as I start with, in science, taking a measurement. And there is clearly a conscious experience of registering a measurement through a measurement process, then I'm going to take for granted the conscious registering of that and the measurement process to make an ontology of the measured. So there is a deeper process that says that to even define observation or experience or measurement well, there 
are these binding of the concepts that are necessary and sufficient, and there's a triplicate kind of binding. If we can define a formal philosophy there, a formal metaphysics there, then the ont- the epistemology of the objective, which will be a reified philosophy of science, is now founded in something that also can give us a epistemology of the subjective and an epistemology of the relationship between the subjective and the objective. And ethics actually lives in the relationship between the subjective and the objective, which is why you have to factor objective measurement metrics, utilitarianism, and why that is necessary, but not sufficient. So Forrest's work, you know, if somebody uh, Googles eminent metaphysics, you'll see a PDF come up. And then he has a few other writings on a website, uvsm.com. Forrest's work. So we know from, from Gödel's theorem, we know from Tarski's theorem that we cannot have a system that is both perfectly complete and perfectly congruent. Um, so one of the things that Forrest ends up doing in the metaphysics is actually defining an upper bound on the knowable. And in any domain where the upper bound on the knowable is, that's something called the incommensuration theorem. And then being able to define what the appropriate epistemic process within the domain of the knowable is, and then also how to do inner domain transfers across the epistemics of different systems. And so basically, as a metaphysics, it is not complete, but it defines the upper bound of what level of completeness could happen. And then it it offers the upper bound of completeness.